Amen. Let's uh, worship the Lord this morning. Jesus, we thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word this morning, God. We give you praise and lift you up, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Amen. Uh, a couple of announcements. So it has communion for today. We're not doing communion today. We will announce a new communion. Um, so, you know. Uh, Brother Robert Dame will be here. Missionary to Bolivia will be here next week. First Wednesday on September 1st. Remember we talked about, we're going to talk about apostolic identity. Right? We're down in Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg last week. And because the North American Youth Congress was canceled, there were uh, probably two dozen churches um, of our particular fellowship down there. Now, how many knows when you're in a mall or an airport or a public space, you can pick out one of our folks from like a thousand feet, right? Ah, that's one of them. One of them. So we, here's what we say. We go, oh, that's a member of the tribe. <laughs> That's one of the tribe. Yeah, that's one of the tribe. We're going to talk about what it means to be a member of the tribe. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to preface this by saying, no one's going to get beat up. We're not going to issue rules or dress codes. Yeah. Right? Our dress policy here at church is yes, please. If you would put on clothes, that would be fantastic. And if you don't want it, we'll put a baptismal robe on you. And you can go free and easy. Whatever. So that's our dress policy. It's yes, please. No, we're not going to issue a rule book. Or, all right? So everybody's like, ah, oh, thank God he's not going to be one of those guys. Um, but if you ever wondered why, we're going to talk about why. All right? All right. No, so no pressure, right? Just, but, you know, if you've wondered... There you go. Uh, September, dude, put it back. I'm not done yet. I'm on a roll. I, didn't, I wasn't even here. To, I may preach until one. Just kidding. I'm not. I'll get hungry before then. <laughs> I was funny. Just like, no, not one o'clock. <laughs> no service on the 5th. That's Labor Day weekend. And then uh, we have missionaries with us on the 19th. The Alphans, who are from Ohio, who are in Iceland and Finland, um, and where it's nice and cool. I was never so glad to come back to Ohio, where the weather is. It was when we were drove, driving home from the symphony last night, watched the Ohio State marching band. It was 67 degrees. It was like, thank you, Jesus, because it's been in the mid to high 90s in Tennessee all week. And I'm like, I'm not even afraid of hell anymore because this is horrible. <laughs> This is awful. Yeah, this is woo. Woo doggy. So, uh, so I'm on a roll today. I'm just telling you, it's going to be a fun one. Thank you for your giving. Do we have a giving slide? We better have a giving slide. There we go. Thank you for your giving. I appreciate that. Uh, it allows us to keep the air conditioning running. Hallelujah. We're so glad for air conditioning. Amen. First Kings chapter 19 and verse 1 goes like this. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had ex executed all the prophets of, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She said, May I be dead if you're not dead this time tomorrow. And all the married people said, Boy, I've had that conversation before. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when he saw that, this is talking about Elijah, he arose and ran for his life. I don't blame him. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. And we're going to talk about this. Elijah and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Now, when I was a kid, <coughs> there was a book called Alexander next and the no, terrible horror. Anybody read this book? Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. This was huge when I was a kid. Huge. Massive. And now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, 
Alexander and I are like tight now. I get it. Um, so as I mentioned before, I'm going to be dangerously transparent with you this morning. Um, so I get a, found a diagram of emotionally what it is like to be a pastor and a church planner. And it looks something like that. Because there are some weeks where like, whoa, we're taking on hell, we're burning out, we're taking the devil, I'm like, punch him in the face myself. And then the next week you're like, oh God, why are we even doing this? <laughs> Nobody comes to church. Nobody wants to be here. Don't look at me like that. Y'all do that too. <laughs> Cherry and I have been married for 32 years and we have a rule that says neither one of us can be psychotic at the same time. Right? One's <laughs> got to be the one to talk them off the ledge. Right? So, so only one person can be nutty at a time. And normally I occupy that space. Yeah, I'm like, I'm the crazy one. It was funny, we were on that sky lift that one day, and Charity was freaking out. That's not what she normally does. She rides roller coasters and all that. Now I'm an out on roller coasters because I'm fat. Because it says, this night may not be accommodate our larger guests, which says, fatty, stay off. Don't go on this. I'm loving it. I'm on this chair lift. I'm like, this is probably because it's something I can ride. And Charity's like, I, 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 I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I, I'm like, well, don't jump because that's a bad idea. So only one of us can be on the ledge. But this is what, what it feels like to be a pastor. One week you're like, woo! And the next week you're like, oh, God, why am I doing this? Right? This was literally me yesterday. God, why? And then Daniel comes in, hey, I got a teaching contract. I'm like, woo! It's, it's okay. Next week, who knows what it'll be. I'm as excited to find out as you are. They're like, my God, what did you have on vacation? We go. <laughs> Deb's like, get out of here more often. What? Well, you're probably not the only one with that opinion. Uh, I'm not against vacations. I just took one. But it, the summer slump is kind of hard sometimes, right? Because we've had Sundays where we're like, boy, I hope I can get a seat. And we heard that Sunday's like, boy, I have my own whole road to myself. How fantastic. <laughs> and that's the hard part about church planning in general. You just want to go bang your head right there. <laughs> right? I want to come in and smack my head right on the wall. And you feel that way sometimes as a pastor. You're like, some Sundays things are great, and some th Sundays they are not. And it's wild, and it's crazy, and it's emotional, and it's not a new problem. We read in our text today, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. And Jezebel said, so help me God, by tomorrow at this time, if he's not as dead as those prophets, God strike me down. And Elijah went, this is a good time for me to exit stage left. Right? There would have been one of those curly cues. Remember on cartoons when people left in a hurry? That's what that would have been like. And I was telling Charity about this, and she goes, well, he's not, you know, he's not wrong. When a woman says she's going to kill you, the best thing to do is probably to run away. I don't know if there was a cryptic message in there for me or what, but I, you know, I slept with one eye open last night. That's all I'm saying. And so... Jezebel has been told everything that Elijah's done, and he's killed these prophets with the sword. So let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 20, and here's what happened. So Ahab uh, sent for the children of Israel and gathered all the prophets together on Mount Carmel, and Elijah uh, came to all the uh, people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So Elijah brings the people to a point of decision. You need to come to a decision in your life. I'm going to follow God or I'm going to follow my flesh. You make, everybody makes that decision. And by not making a decision, you've made a decision. Right? You either go, I am going to follow God. You have to be intentional about it. I, I got up this morning, <coughs> and even though I wasn't feeling it, I went to church. You, made, you, made, you were intentional. 
Or you went, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to stay home and watch the live stream. Or you said, I'm going to stay home and watch cartoons. Whatever. But by making a choice or not making a choice, you've made a choice. You've decided to follow God or follow your flesh. And, and Elijah goes, how long are you going to wait to decide? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is, follow him. And the people answered nothing. Not answering is an answer. You must be intentional about following God. So the story goes on. It says in verse 23, Therefore, let them give us two bowls that we may choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the people said, it is well spoken. So here's the plan, he said. He said, we're going we're gonna to set up two sacrifices, two bowls on two altars, no, no fire. And the prophets of Baal set theirs up first. And Elijah mocks them, right? He says, and I love these trains. One says, maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping. Go to the next slide. He says, maybe he's on the toilet. Literally, one translation says, maybe your God's in the bathroom. Daniel's taking a picture of that because that's going to wind up on Facebook now. Me standing in front of a toilet. There you go. You read into that what you want. He goes, maybe he's in the can. When you accuse somebody's God of being unable to answer because he's in the can with his cell phone, the cell phone part I added, that's not in the Bible, right? That's cold. Maybe, he's on a, maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's in the bathroom. I read that in a translation. I thought, surely that's not right because that is hilarious, right? The Bible has these nuggets where you go, did they really say that? Right? Maybe your God's in the bathroom. So the, the prophets of Baal start cutting themselves till the blood flows, the Bible says. They scream and they cry, and, and the Bible says the blood gushed out of them and nothing happens all day long. Nothing's happening. And Elijah's having a good old time, just laughing at him. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Can I tell you, the first step to renewal is repairing your altars. You've got to reestablish the commitments you once had and reestablish your relationship with God. You will never have a, uh, a, a fulfilling relationship with God until you rebuild your altars. Brother Man talked about that in Sunday school this morning. I, I do. I say, get a Bible reading plan. Take time in your devotion. I do it every morning. You know, spend time with God. Uh, it is so important that you spend that time with God and rebuild those altars and have relationship with Him. And so, uh, Elijah sacrifices the bull. He cuts it up. He puts it on the altar. And he pours three sets of four water pots on the sacrifice. So 12 pots of water on the sacrifice. This is in the middle of a drought when water is at a premium. Cuts it up, pours water on it, right? Raising the degree of difficulty. And he prays a 63-word prayer. You don't have to pray long prayers. You have to pray sincere prayers. We try and impress. I have done this in my younger days. I don't do it anymore because hopefully I'm older and wiser. You ever pray in, in the King James language? O oh Lord, we beseech thou that thou wouldest come to us in all thy great mercy and toucheth us and all that good stuff. Right? <laughs> You're like, boy, that, you know... Either his tongue is too big for his mouth or, you know, he's, you know, doesn't know. What to, and we do that. And, and I want to go talk to God like you talk to a friend. God. Okay, here's here's my pastoral prayer all the time. God, I am in so far over my head. I need help. God, I need a word for your people. 
right? That isn't flowery, but that's sincere. And God loves sincere prayers. God loves honest prayers. Don't try and be flowery. Don't use, unless you walk around and talk to people in the King James language, Right, and, 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 and if you're a dude wearing tights and speaking, you got other problems, right? You got bigger problems than, yeah. Sincere prayers are what God's answer. Here's what happened in verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and all the water in the trench. Wow! The fire comes down and burns up the rocks and the dust, and, the, and there is nothing left. And Elijah goes, who's on the Lord's side? And they take the 450 prophets of Baal down to the river, and they kill every one of them. Yeah, the Old Testament's rated R. I'm telling you, it's rough. I remember Kathy go, when she started doing a Bible reading plan, she goes, did you know this was in the Bible? Yeah, it was a surprise for you. It gets worse. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, so he kills them all. Now, the part that we didn't put up on, because I don't want to preach till one o'clock, you're welcome, um, is after that he tells Ahab, he goes, he goes and checks seven times for any, and his servant goes, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And Elijah goes, you better get booking. It's going to rain. It's going to flash flood. And Elijah, who's an old man, girds his loins, which is a great phrase. It just means he tied up his robe so he could run, and he outruns a chariot. A horse runs 30 miles an hour. <laughs> an average human who's cooking doesn't run that fast. Olympians don't sprint that fast. And he's tied up, this old guy's tied up his robe, and he outruns Ahab's chariot. That's some wild stuff. After he gets done killing 450 people, I'd need Gatorade after that, right? Look, I've been, that doesn't make a good commercial. I killed 450 guys and I ran a chariot. You're a psychopath, right? <laughs> but that's where he is at the end of chapter 18. He's killed 450 prophets and he's outrun a chariot. Now I'm going to Disney World. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he gets to the 19th chapter. Go ahead and put the next verse up. And Jezebel goes, if, I, if tomorrow he's still alive, the gods will kill me. I'm going to kill him like he killed those prophets. And when he saw that, he arose. There you go. And ran for his life. And went to Beersheba. And he said to him, uh, but he went a day's journey in the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough. Elijah's a bit of a drama queen, all right? Let's just establish that now. Your pastor is also a bit of a drama queen, so just ride this horse with me if you don't mind. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my fathers who were dead. That dude is three verses removed from killing the 450 prophets of Baal and outrunning a chariot. And because one over-made-up woman goes, I'm going to kill you. He's like, well, that's all I need to hear. God, just kill me now. Kill me now. Jezebel's bent out of shape. And he just wants to die. He doesn't do well with adversity, does he? No, he really doesn't. You ever, don't raise your hand and don't point, but in your heart just went, God, punch my ticket. I'm just sick of it all. <laughs> we might not say it, but we integrate it in other ways that we are ready to quit. On the heels of great miracles, we become dispirited. We had a great move of God. And then people didn't show up. Oh, God. I'm going to quit. Oh, I don't even know why we're doing this. What? It's not unique. It happened to one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament. Remember, Elijah shows up with Moses at the transfiguration. 
right? Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he comes and he shines like this bright life and he, and he communicates with Elijah and Moses, right? So, you know, Elijah has rock star status. And he's three verses removed from this and he's like, God, just kill me. Just kill me now. And the Lord, like a good father, says the right words. Verse 5. Then he, as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. So he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he rose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and nights as far as Horeb to the mountain of God. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is have something to eat and take a nap. Hallelujah. We could end the sermon right there and everybody would be like, Woo, I feel Jesus. He ate and drank and he laid down. And it worked so well he did it again. You ever read in the New Testament where Jesus went off to pray? Sometimes you got to go just disconnect a bit, right? And he went and he took a nap. And he rested. And he had the strength for a 40-day journey. Because God will not speak to a busy mind or a tired mind. You can't receive a word from the Lord when you're busy or when you're tired. How many knows you're not supposed to make decisions when you're tired? When you're tired, when you're sick, when you're angry. Because you're not thinking straight. And you make emotional decisions and not rational decisions. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost all over this place. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just need to rest and disconnect. Do you know that this thing has an off button? Oh my God, it does! Do you know that you can remove social media apps from your phone? What? Jessica's getting the Holy Ghost back there. Right? There are times... How many times do you... Okay, I won't lay this on you. I'll lay this on me. You ever scroll through Facebook and get mad? I can't believe it. Well, I will comment on that. We've got pointing going on out there. You should see what I see. <laughs> Jesus. Mm, spirit's being revealed right now. And the Holy Ghost is trying to slap the phone out of your hand. Sometimes you need to put it down and take a rest and let your mind clear. I I tell the church this, right? We go on a fast at the beginning of the year. And one of the things we fast, you you turn off your social media. And we do that for three weeks. And everybody goes, oh, God, I feel so good. I wasn't on Facebook. I wasn't angry. I felt so good. I was able to connect with God. Fast is over. I guess I'm going back on Facebook. Let me put it to you this way. Oh, God, I stopped drinking that arsenic, and I feel so much better. My eyes aren't bleeding, and neither are my ears. It's fantastic. Well, the fast is over. Cheers, arsenic. And we go back to the thing. I'm kind of not preaching against social media because people are watching on Facebook right now. right? But if that thing causes you to not be in good relationship with God, put it down. If you read that and get angry, eh, why not? <laughs> if you find yourself looking at things that don't help your relationship with God, put it down. And if you need to, if, for you iPhone users, press the button real hard and a pop up will come. And one of the options is remove app. And because they make money off that, they'll go, are you sure? The answer is yes. I'm not against social media, but if it makes you angry or it takes you away from, puts you in an attitude or a spirit that isn't conducive to having a relationship with God, I would rather go to heaven without Facebook. Oh, that's hard preaching. 
Sometimes you just need to disconnect and get close to God. Amen? You got to love me to go to heaven. We need to hear the voice of God, but we need to put ourselves in a position to hear the voice of God. And sometimes we need to turn off the noise. Hey, that's good preaching, if you, whether you like it or not. Hallelujah. Verse 9. And there he went into a cave, and he spent the night in the place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for you, the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I'm the only one left, and they want to kill me. The Lord comes to him and says, why are you here? You are only 40 days out from, a huge, from two huge miracles. And now you're hiding in a cage. And here's his answer. I've worked so hard for you, and I did everything for you, and the children of Israel are poo heads. That's my translation. The amplified version, buckle your seatbelts, kids, we're about to get real, is I've worked so hard for you, and I haven't seen any results. and a holy hush comes across the place. Told you we were going to be real today. We can't live on the mountaintop. When Charity and I were in Tennessee, we went up to Clingman's Dome, which is the highest point in the Rocky Mountains. And it's uh, 6,600 feet. And you know what grows up there? Scrub. Evergreens. Nothing you can eat. Because that type of thing doesn't come on a mountaintop. It comes in the valley. The valley is where that stuff grows. And you can't live there. You need to come off the mountain to grow. Verse 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. There's a tornado, an earthquake, and a fire. Lots of noise, lots of action, and God isn't in any of it. Sometimes we think that God, the thing that we think is God, is just noise. And then there's that still small voice. Folks, it's so important that we learn to hear the voice of God. It is so important that prayer is a two-way conversation, that you hear and feel God speak to your spirit. Prayer is not where I go and do a monologue to God but I interact and I hear him speak to my heart and speak to my spirit and give me the words of life. You can't live for him if you don't know his voice. And so the Lord asked him again in verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in the mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and he said, ask that question one more time. What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said... I've been zealous for the Lord and the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek to take my life. What are you? I read that and I thought, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? The Lord speaks. You know, the Lord knows your name. The Lord knows your name. I'm so glad we serve a God who knows our names, who has a personal relationship. And he asked the same question he asked in verse 9. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And in verse 10, Elijah gives the same answer. I mean, notice insanity, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, let me give you the answer that you rejected the first time. Maybe this time it'll work. He's not bright. 
And the Lord doesn't even address his complaints. You kids ever do that? Mom! In our house, it's mom. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> and my wife, in wisdom, will just issue edicts and just ignore whatever they just said. Because she is a wise woman. And I would take them out. And the Lord doesn't even address what he says. Next, go to the next slide. Here's what the Lord said to him, go. It's apparently you didn't get the point when I said, what are you doing here? He says, go. And return the way of the wilderness to Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king of Syria, and anoint Jehu, the king of Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, whatever, you shall anoint as the prophet in your place. The Lord says, the pity party is over. Get to moving. The Lord has had that same conversation with me. Get over it, boy. You got work to do. You go anoint Hazel as king. You anoint Jehu as king. And you go anoint Elijah as the prophet who's going to follow you. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. And I'm a glass half full kind of guy sometimes. So I'm going to make this glass half full. When he says anoint Elisha as prophet in your place, I've heard it preached that this was a rebuke and said, I've already picked out your replacement. You're done. Now that doesn't jive with the scripture though because Elijah goes on to do notable miracles after that. Here's what he, I think it says. And you hear this, this ooh, feel the Holy Ghost. You hear this if you don't hear anything else. He says, you go anoint Elisha because not only is your not, ministry not over, but your ministry is going to continue after your God. The things that you're building right now, and you think I'm the only one doing it, and you think I'm not seeing any results, I want you to go anoint the guy who's going to continue your ministry. Remember what happens when Elisha gets called up in the fire? He goes, what do I want? I want the mantle of Elijah, and I want a double portion of what he's got. Because whatever he's doing, I want to do twice that much. That doesn't sound to me like somebody who God's done with. It sounds like somebody who's planning something and growing something. And God said, I'm going to take what you've started. I'm going to put that spirit in Elisha, and he's going to do twice what you did. And he's going to carry on your ministry so that after you're gone, the ministry you started is going to keep right on going. Don't quit, even though you're discouraged. God is still working his purpose in you. Here's the last verses. And I thought these were kind of throwaways, but they're not. It says, And it shall, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. He says, You're going to go anoint people. We're going to deal with your enemies. He said, You anoint the king of Israel. You anoint the king of Judah, and you anoint the prophet, and they will handle your enemies. They will take care of you. You just do what I told you to do. I've already put in place the people who are going to take out the distraction and take out the things that keep you from succeeding in your purpose with me. He said, oh, and by the way, I have 7,000 people who have never bowed their knee to Baal. When you think you're by yourself, God goes, you have no idea the army I have working for you and with you. He said, there, remember, Elijah goes, and I'm the only one that's left. And God says, oh, no, I've got 7,000 people who've never bowed their knee. When you think 
God, I don't see it. This is all I've got. God goes, I'm working behind the scenes. I'm moving in things that you can't see yet. But I have put in place not just what I'm going to do through you, but what I'm going to do after your ministry is over. I'm going to put in place a purpose and a plan to see things expand and see people saved. And the seeds you're planting now, you may not harvest that crop, but someone will. One of the hardest things about being a church planner is you're plowing up ground for the first time. Right? You invite people. Sometimes they come. Sometimes they don't. I got Marilyn filling up rows now. God bless her. And we invite. And sometimes they come. Sometimes they don't. And we invite. Sometimes they come. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they come for a few weeks and they stop coming. God did not call us to produce results. The parable says, a sower, and I love this, a sower went out to what? Sow, not plant. You ever plant? All right, go in a row. That's a fun sound. Right? And you plant. Charity's got these garden boxes in our backyard. Looks like the Vietnamese jungle in my backyard. Just, you know, waiting for the VC to blow me up when I go mow the yard. That's why I don't mow the yard. I have Bubby do it. Huh? <laughs> right? That's planting. You know what sowing is? Cast it wide. And I trust that the seed that is cast, nature will do its thing. God will do its thing, right? You're like, I've sowed and sowed and sowed. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. Oh, I've asked them to church and they won't come. Keep asking. Because somebody caught you on the right day when you were hungry, when you were desperate. And you're like, tell me about the God of Kathy. Tell me about the God of Donna Teresa. You keep right on sowing. Right? You're going to live on that roller coaster with me. Make sure the thing is locked in. That's all I can say. The only person who gets hurt on a roller coaster is the guy who gets off in the middle. Right? Keep on sowing. Some's going to fall on the rocks. Some's going to fall on the thorns. But some's going to fall on good ground. Amen. And it's going to, you're going to go, hey, come to church with me. And you're going to hit them at the right moment. When they go, I am desperate in my life for something more. And I've seen what God's done in you. And if he's done it in you, he'll do it in me. Right. Amen. Let's stand this morning. A wonderful song. We're not going to sing it because I want to stay married another year. And I do not spring songs on my wife, ever. But the song says, even when I don't see him, he's working. Even when I don't feel him, he's working. And I felt that way sometimes. Oh, God. It seems like church planning. One step up, two steps back. One step up, two steps back. One step up, two steps back. And that song comes to me. Even when I don't see him, he's working. He's moving. I have not been called to produce results. I have been called to sow seed and feed sheep. And however many sheep the Lord decides to put in this pen is his business. But if we are faithful, So will our Father in heaven be faithful to us. Don't quit. Don't quit. Oh, God, it seems like a struggle sometimes. I know. Me too. Don't quit. Don't quit. For in due season, God will reward you. Not for what you produce. For your faithfulness. For your faithfulness. 
I can't control if next Sunday 100 people come through the door. And I'd love that. We'd have to set out chairs. Here's what I can tell you. Next Sunday, I'm going to come here. I'm going to worship God. Because that's all I can control. And I'm going to do what I've been called to do. And if I'm faithful to Him, He'll be faithful to me. Amen? You believe it? Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are faithful, God, to reward, Lord God, those who are faithful to you, those who work, Lord God. If they don't see results, that they know that that's in your hands, that you're going to move in the Holy Spirit. You're going to touch hearts and lives in your time and in your way. We thank you, God, for what we felt today and believe for greater things than these going forward. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Next week we have missionaries. Looking forward to that. I love every one of you twice as much because I wasn't here last week. And ain't nothing you can do about it. God bless you. I'll see you next week.